mysteries of salvation. So as we are looking for the soon return of Jesus, we want to make sure that we know him. And so we'll be talking a lot about that tonight. Uh, But salvation is simple. It is in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. So salvation is simple, but we first have to realize that we are a sinner, that we need a savior. So Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. And so we need a savior and God prepared ahead of time, Jesus, to come and be that lamb slain before the foundation of the world to pay that price for us. So we believe that, that Jesus is God, that he is able to save us because of his divinity. He is God and that what he did on the cross is enough. So Romans 6, 23 tells us the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus, our Lord. And so we, we have this salvation in the finished work of Jesus Christ. So we believe in him. We put our trust in him that he saved us. And then we're confessing that Jesus is our Lord. You know, we are repenting and repenting doesn't mean saying you're sorry for every sin you do. Repenting is a change of mind. And so when we repent, we are turning from our way to God's way. And when we confess, we are proclaiming that Jesus is our Lord. So Romans 10, 9 through 10 tells us, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's your heart you're justified, and with the mouth one confesses to salvation. And John 1.12 tells us, But to all who did receive him, Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to be children of God. And so we have this amazing gift that God has given us in salvation. And when we look at the gospel, and gospel means good news, so when we look at salvation, and this is the best news, The best news is this free gift of salvation. But the rapture is the rest of the gospel. Because not only did Jesus save us, but he's coming to take us to be his own. And so when we're looking forward to the rapture, we're looking forward to the rest of the gospel. We've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. We've been giving, we've been given the Holy Spirit as a pledge, as a promise that he will come back and retrieve us to himself. And so that's the who of the rapture. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. We're going to be talking about the who of the rapture, uh, which of course is Jesus, that we're not just looking for an escape route. Uh, Praise God, he is going to rescue us before the tribulation begins, but we're not looking forward to an escape. We're looking forward to a person. Jesus Christ. That's the whole purpose of the rapture. So Philippians 3.20 tells us, but our citizenship is in heaven. When we received Jesus as our savior, we became a citizen of heaven. We're an ambassador now of heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we are eagerly waiting for our redemption, the redemption of our bodies. We're eagerly, eagerly waiting for the rapture. And so, you know, I don't know about you guys, but um, I can get really preoccupied with this. I can get really preoccupied with with thinking about him. And for the past uh, couple years since we've been doing this, almost a couple years since we've been doing this, we've explored so many different facets of Jesus's return and eschatology and who Jesus is. And, you know, we've, uh, I think we've had close to 70 classes uh, in the past uh, couple years. And that's a lot to talk about eschatology. And every class is new. Every week, God gives us something else to focus on related to his return. And so I've been blown away that we continue to have stuff to talk about. And there's so much to talk about. And so we have been, um, uh, we have explored so many different things uh, and we can find ourselves daydreaming. I find myself daydreaming thinking, you know, what is it going to be like when the sky opens 
And what is he going to be like? And, and what am I going to do when I see him and when I'm, when I'm face to face to him? And that's okay. You know, sometimes, you know, you've heard, I'm sure you guys have heard the um, too heavenly minded for any earthly good. Uh, that phrase is straight from the devil, (laughs) because if we are, God tells us to set our mind on things above and not on this earth, because we want to, everything we want, everything we do, we want to be doing it in a, with a biblical worldview. So it is wonderful to be daydreaming about our God. It helps to center us and focus us, and it helps to paint our worldview with everything that's going on. Um, I get, uh, this is kind of off topic, but, but I get text messages from, from people that are hurting, um, through this ministry that I started helping out with. And, and I can't tell you how many it's, I'm lonely, I'm anxious, I'm depressed. I'm, and there is, there's no true joy outside of Jesus. Everything is, is short-lived. Everything is dependent upon something else. And so all these, I just, I keep wanting to just cut to the chase. And I do somewhat, I'm always praying with them. But sometimes it's, it, you need Jesus. Jesus is what you need. Jesus is the answer to all of these things. And when your worldview is framed with him, then you just look at the world differently. And so what is in your heart and what is in your mind, it spills out. And so we, as the bride, looking for our bridegroom to come, we're excited about seeing him. And if you have ever talked to a bride when she's engaged and it's that that period of time where it's getting close to her wedding, she can't help but talk about her fiance. She can't help but mention the wedding plans. I know for me, when when I was engaged, I don't think I had a conversation that I didn't somehow try to slip in something about the wedding or try to slip in something about my my then fiance now husband. And so that's part of it because that's you're completely preoccupied with this life that changes everything. And we should be. It's a great gift to us that we can be preoccupied with this life that changes everything. And so those of us that are looking, those of us for awaiting, it paints everything. And so I find myself slipping it in a lot of conversations, you know, Jesus is coming back. I, and I, I think that that's an important reminder. And I think those of us that are watching for his return, it, it's actually part of our responsibility to slip that into conversations and to remind people that this isn't just, this isn't normal. Jesus is coming back. Normal's not coming back. Jesus is coming back. There's it, the things that are happening. The Bible said that they would happen. Uh, it, it's surprising to me, but a lot of people are not aware that that's the case. A lot of people are not aware of what the Bible says about these last days. And so, you know, what are some of the responses that that we get, that I get when uh, you know, when I mention that, when I slip in the rapture, when I slip in, Jesus is coming back. You know, those that are watching also, you immediately like to make a best friend. <laughs> you know, you can immediately see in their face, they light up. You can immediately see this is a brother or sister in Christ that I'm going to know forever. And there is this immediate joy and to where you get each other right away. Uh, now, then there's unbelievers that that are going to mock and they're going to be fearful and they should be. Because if you are, if you do not personally know Jesus as your savior, the tribulation period is horrifying. And Jesus himself said it is the worst time that the planet will ever, ever experience worse than the flood. And so an unbeliever should be afraid. But at the same time, we don't want to not mention it to unbelievers because they need to wake up. They need to see that he's coming. It's not loving to omit the truth because whether or not people believe the truth, it doesn't change what truth is. And 
the sooner that they realize that maybe the sooner that they'll receive Jesus and not have to go through the tribulation period. But the part that, and I expect unbelievers to mock, I expect unbelievers to not believe because they're unbelievers. Just like, you know, you expect sinners to sin because they're sinners, right? Um, that shouldn't surprise us, you know, how people behave. Uh, but believers who mock, that is always, I guess, the most frustrating to me. And it's the most confusing to me. And so we're going to talk about that for a minute because I've really asked God about this. Why aren't people excited? You know, I feel, I figured people would be so excited. And I, I'm surprised sometimes by brothers and sisters in Christ when I'll say something and they immediately throw up a wall. And I wonder why, why are you throwing up that wall? And sometimes the wall is no one knows the day or hour, <laughs> you know? I've literally had people say that walking by when I'm talking about eschatology, they'll say that, which doesn't even make sense in the context. It's not even talking about a day, not even talking about a time frame. No one knows the day or hour. And, and it's like code for stop talking about his return. But they forget, they, they're not, or they're ignorant that after Jesus says, no one knows the day or hour, he goes on to say, therefore, watch. So you're not caught off guard. And so we are told to watch. And many believers today are also ignorant that the early church majored on the book of Revelation and on Jesus's return. You see that in the New Testament because most of the New Testament is actually written with the end in mind. Most of the New Testament was written by believers who thought they were going to see the end. But also as we've uncovered early first century and early church writings, uh, the most quoted book is the book of Revelation. And so the early church was reading the book of Revelation and really majored on it. And the early church didn't separate salvation from Jesus's return. They really clumped together salvation, Jesus's first coming with his second coming, understanding that it's not just an engagement, but there's also a marriage coming. And they put it together. They put it together because it's the rest of the gospel, that he's returning is over a third of the Bible. And if you really look at types and shadows and that pattern is prophecy, it's much more than a third of the, pro uh, a third of the Bible is, is talking about the end. So we're not indefinitely engaged. You know, if you think about this, sometimes we act like it. We act like we are indefinitely engaged, but we're not. A wedding is coming. And we are the blessed generation that gets to see the signs that that wedding is almost here. So, but even if we were not literally living in the last moments, the last days, now I believe we are literally living in the Bible. I don't think that's, I don't think that's reaching at all. I think it's pretty obvious by everything that we see, what Jesus told us to look for, that we are literally living in the Bible. Uh, but even if we weren't, even if we were living a hundred years ago before Israel uh, became a nation again, we would need to study one third of the Bible that is eschatology. That's our responsibility as believers to study the full counsel of God's word from Genesis to Revelation and not just pick different parts, but we need to actually read the full context of his word from cover to cover and then repeat from cover to cover. Uh, because that is God's letter to us. He wants us to understand his word. And the more we read his word, the more it just technicolor a biblical worldview. It overrides everything else when you read his word. And so the more that believers read the book, the more that they will see that we're living in this amazing time. And we have so much hope, not because of where the government's going, not because of all those things that we can, you know, put, that we can hope in man for, 
but we have so much hope because G- we're actually seeing what Jesus said would happen. We're actually seeing what the Bible says would happen. And we're living in these days. It's the most exciting time to live since Jesus walked the earth. And so this is an amazing time to be a Christian because we have this rock solid proof that no other religion has. No other religion has a holy book that is 100% accurate in prophecy and telling the future. But one thing, we don't use it well enough because we need to know it and understand prophecy to be able to tell our brothers and sisters that are, are, are those unbelievers that don't know Jesus yet. The Bible said that this would happen. You know, we can really sound like a prophet <laughs> Not because we are a prophet, but because we know what the book says. And so we know what's going to happen. We may not know exactly when it's going to happen, but we know the patterns that we're going to see because of God's word unfolding before us. And so it's a great faith builder. It's a great evangelistic tool and discipleship tool that we get to see this. And so, you know, why? Why the mocking and why the willful ignorance? I think there's, and we're going to unpack some of those reasons. And this is something that I've asked God a lot about because I, I, it's hard for me to understand because I can't wait for that day. (laughs) You know, I get giddy thinking about when I get to see him. And I felt this way for 20 years. Now, not this intense (laughs) as I do now. I think it would be hard to have this intensity for 20 years, but But I have been excited about and watching for Jesus' return since 9-11. And watching for Jesus has always been that center for me. When I started to get too busy, you know, I've worked for a church for over 20 years. So when I start to get too busy doing God's work, it's always been watching for Jesus that brings me back and focuses me back on my relationship with him. That this isn't just, this isn't religion. This is a relationship with a person that I'm going to get to meet and a person that I get to spend every day with. You know, I get to spend every day with him in, in praying and reading the Bible. He speaks to me and, he, and he, he draws me close and shows me. But prophecy has always been that that peace that brings me back and that focuses me and gets me excited. He's always used that to center me. It's always had a purifying effect on me. And so it's first John three, two through three um, really speaks to me. Beloved, now we are sons of God and it's not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. And so this hope that we're going to get to see Jesus, it makes you want to live a different way because you're really thinking about Jesus and you live different when you're thinking about Jesus. You don't, you know, you don't want to do some of the things that you would do if you're not thinking about Jesus. You want to live a pure life a purified life. And so this looking for Jesus, watching for his return, it purifies us. And here John wrote this, you know, nearly 2000 years ago. So this is what the church is always supposed to have been doing. The church is always supposed to be thinking about that day when he appears and we appear with him. And, you know, those that, those that died through the years, through this, in this time of the Gentiles, in this time of grace, they just beat us by a split second. You know, they're with him now, but they are waiting for this moment, just like we are. And so what are some of the reasons that we have this, the scoffing and the willfully ignorant? Well, um, Peter, Peter told us that this would happen and he explained it. So second Peter three, three through six says, Though shall come in the last days scoffers, saying all things continue as they were from the beginning. And that may be one of the main things here. There's this normalcy bias. 
there's never been a rapture before. So we have no way of putting a frame of reference to that. We have no way of understanding what that's going to look like or how that's going to be because we've never experienced it. In America, we have had such prosperity and, and um, peace. We don't know what our brothers and sisters all over the planet have experienced of turmoil and war and, and persecution. We've never experienced those things. So for us, it's just gonna continue being the way it is. It's hard for us to even to imagine that the things that we're being told right now are coming, famines and, and government control um, and a great reset and a new monetary system, all these things that they're, they're coming right out and saying, we're, we're gonna do this to you globally. <laughs> no one gets out, America doesn't get out of this. We're gonna do this to you, we're gonna do this to everybody. It's so easy to see it and think, that's not going to really happen because we've never experienced it. But the Bible says that it will happen. So everything's going to continue. Normal, normalcy bias for they are willingly ignorant. And we'll talk a little bit about why. But it's easier to be ignorant sometimes. It's easier just to dig your head in the sand like the picture we looked at before. That by the word of God, the heavens are of old. And the world that was then being overflowed with water perished. And so, you know, destruction has come in the days of Noah and it will come again. And that's actually one thing that Jesus uses to describe the days that are coming, that they'll be like the days of Noah. And right now we really are in the days of Noah. Everything, people are completely oblivious to what's coming, even though it's spelled out what's coming. So why? Well, I think the main thing, it comes down to fear. And, and I understand that fear. When I was in college, um, and I'd always kind of, my mom had told me when I was growing up that because of Israel, she had this understanding of Israel would be that last generation. And because of Israel, that um, Jesus would probably come, you know, she didn't know if he would come in her lifetime, but she figured he'd come in my lifetime. So I had heard that, but when I was in college, there was, um, there were some people talking about the end and I remember being fascinated by it, but also really, really scared. And I just did not want it to happen anytime soon. <laughs> you know, I just didn't want it to happen soon because I still wanted to do what I wanted to do. I still wanted my way. I was a prodigal at the time and I wanted my way. I didn't want to turn back around and follow God. I wanted to follow my desires. And so it scared me to hear about the end because I didn't want, I didn't want to stop having my way. And I think that is probably the reason for most people for wanting to bury their hand, head is because they want their way. And if you realize that Jesus really could come back very soon, it kind of blows up your way. Um, but it's supposed to, because we're really supposed to wait on God and not rush ahead and ask him to bless our plans. But that's kind of what we're used to. We're used to making our plans and just trying to sprinkle some holy water on it if we're a Christian and saying, well, God bless my plans. Um, God has gone out of his way in my life to never do anything I plan, <laughs> which at times has been very, very frustrating because I can't make plans to save my life, but he won't let me. He always does something better than my plans, but he never does my plans. He never does it the way I pray for it. He always does it different. But I think he's done that to show me that what he wants is so much better than what I want. Because I learned that lesson a long time ago that I don't want my what I want. I want what he wants. And I learned I'm not going to plan ahead because 
I don't want my way. I want his way. And his way is so much better because there's no way I could have planned all the things he's done, the things he's done for me. There's no way I could have ever manipulated and planned it to happen. And I like it that way because what he does is so much better than anything I could do. And so that fear when we have, I, I guess we can be control freaks. We can all, all be control freaks. So what are we afraid of? I think um, many believers are afraid of the unknown. We're afraid of the unknown. Because like I said before, we have no reference point for a rapture. We have no reference point for the end times. We have it in the Bible, but we haven't experienced it. No one's experienced a rapture that is here to tell us about it. You know, <laughs> Elijah isn't here right now to explain it to us and not what it was like. Um, and everything that we're about to experience is going to be completely different than what we, we are expecting and, and ready for. And everything fleshly that we've built is worthless in heaven. Everything of the flesh, everything of our imagination and our genius and, and our way is absolutely worthless there. It all burns up. The only thing that goes into the kingdom is the stuff that Jesus builds through us. It's those relationships, those people that we told about Jesus, those seeds that we planted, the works that we've done, that it's him doing it through us. That's all that goes. And that can be scary because there, you know, there's, we can build up a lot. We can build up a kingdom here on earth and it's meaningless in the kingdom to come unless it was Jesus that built it. And that can be scary. And one thing I hear a lot is the fear of missing out. You know, I don't want Jesus to come because I've got, you know, I want to see my kids grow up. I don't want to see Jesus come because I haven't gotten married yet or haven't had a baby yet. You know, there's those kinds of, which are very understandable things, but it also comes down to, we don't understand the goodness and the fullness of God. And this has happened to this has happened to me a couple of times where um, I was kind of bold enough to tell the truth and uh, where the comment was made. Um, you know, where do you see yourself in 20 years? And so I'm sure you guys kind of if you know me. I see myself in my glorified body back on Earth after the tribulation period in 20 years. Now, when you say that to somebody, you can get some very interesting looks. But one thing that that really, you know, and I can kind of understand uh, your, your just crazy look probably better. But response I got twice from believers were, I could tell by the way they responded to me that they were like, why do you want to die? And it hit me. I'm like, I don't. I'm not going to die. I really don't believe I don't, I haven't gotten a word from God or anything like that, but I don't think I'm going to die. I think we are the generation that doesn't have to die and anything could happen, but I don't plan on dying. I plan on being one of those blessed people of this generation. Not everyone dies. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. But we will all be changed in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. And Paul didn't think he was going to die. He thought he was going to be changed. At least when he wrote this, he did. And so he later knew he was going to die. But it's, you know, we have this wrong thought that when the rapture happens it's the end or when we die it's the end but it's not in a lot of ways this right here is like boot camp in a lot of ways this right here is our engagement period it's our in utero those are all holdings until the real beginning starts in utero, 
the baby is being prepared and being ready and being built. But the real beginning starts when the baby's born and the baby actually gets to see the world. In the Hebrew wedding ceremony during the engagement period, they were, they were unified. They were husband and wife, but that was the preparation time. That was when the bride was getting ready and the bridegroom was preparing a place for her. And it was that preparation time, but it really began when they got married and they started their life together. And so what we have to look forward to is just so huge. And it doesn't override or cancel anything that we're ha that's happening right now. God is going to use everything that's happening right now for what's to come. And I think we're going to be in awe of what he uses. And the little things that happened on this side that are going to be impactful thousands of years from now. So you know, the missing out. There's nothing that this world has to offer that can compare to what God has in store for us. And why? Why is that? It's because everything that we really cherish on, on this earth is a type and shadow to understand God. It's all about him. You know, most people would would say family is the most important thing that we have on the side is family loved ones family and friends people that we really love and cherish god created that god created those unions god created those family systems that dependency on one another he created all of that before he ever created us to show us himself the most prized thing that we have is just a type and shadow to explain to us who he is. So the family relationships and, and, you know, our families don't just dissolve and go away when we go to heaven. We're still going to know each other. We're still, we're, it's going to be more. We're going to know each other more. It would be different, but it's going to be more. And so we're not going to lose anything. We don't lose anything. We only gain. Marriage. The whole man and, and woman, husband and wife, that is all a mystery to explain Jesus and the church. Marriage itself is a type and shadow of what's in heaven, not the other way around. What's in heaven is not a type and shadow of what we get to do here. What we get to do here is a type and shadow of what, of who we are to Jesus and who he is to us. And so those that don't get to marry here, that's okay. That's okay because we're going to experience what marriage is really all about one day. We're going to actually go to the wedding of the lamb one day. Those who have a horrible marriage here, it's okay. You're going to have the best marriage ever. It's a type and shadow. And sometimes we get it twisted and we get it upside down. But what we have here is its main purpose is to teach us about him, to teach us about who he is to us. And then purpose, he gave us this desire to live with purpose, this desire to have a reason, you know, to, to do well, to achieve. Um, and, and a lot of people are really depressed because they don't feel like their life has purpose. But he created us for purpose. And one day, regardless of if you feel like you have purpose or not on this side, you do. And one day you're going to fully know your purpose because you were created for something, not just on this side, but you were created eternally for something. So uh, Colossians tells us, therefore, do not let anyone judge you. And this is, you know, this is about 
holy days and stuff. But I think this really speaks to what we're talking about here too. Don't let anyone judge you on what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Sabbath day. These are shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. And that's, that's true for everything. Everything is a shadow, but the reality is found in Christ. So here, why, why are believers afraid of the end? Um, the worst case scenario is that they don't actually know him. And, you know, if you don't actually know him, if you're just going through the motions of cultural Christianity, if you're just going to church because it's the thing to do, or because, you know, your mom made you or something like that, um, if it's because it's part of your identity is whatever your religion is, but you don't really have a relationship with him, um, that, yeah, you'd be scared. You would be scared. And that's a good scare because you need to know him. There's no salvation outside of Jesus. Um, if you're just going through the motions, then it's going to be scary because you're not ready. And the way that we're ready is being in Christ. That's the only way that you're ready for his return is being in Christ. Now, when we talk about getting ready, there's also that part of you want to be beautiful for your bridegroom. You want to spend time with him because you love him. And that's a natural outpouring of that. And so Mark uh, 13, 35 tells us, for the son of man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Watch you therefore, for you know not when the master of the house come at even or at midnight or at the clock or at the cock crowing or in the morning, least coming suddenly, he shall find you sleeping. And what should I say unto you? Until you all watch. And so we don't want to be found sleeping. And the worst thing is those that are sleeping that don't know him. So we need to be watching. Um, through scripture, it tells us, Jesus himself tells us repeatedly to watch, to watch for him. And so uh, Matthew 24, 42 through 45, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord does come. But know this, if the good man of the house had known in which, in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore, you, be you ready, for at such an hour you think not the Son of Man comes. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he comes, shall find so doing. And so we need to be watching and we need to be feeding. We need to be sharing God's word with others. So I've spoken to a lot of believers um, since 2020 over the years, um, since COVID and shared similar stories. And many believers had a wake up call and even unbelievers who came to Christ because they looked around and they said, well, hold on a minute, this looks familiar. I think we're in the end times and it caused them to read their Bible when they had never read their Bible before. It caused them to really seek God when they were just going through the motions before. Like I said, this is studying the end times is the best, is the best evangelism, the best discipleship, because this is real. He is real. He's coming back. Nothing will motivate you like this is real. And so it was a great wake up call. And I've heard so many that said that it really helped them get serious about their relationship with Jesus. They realized they're in the end and that propelled them to dive into reading their Bibles. They started actually reading the Bible, not just reading devotions and, and picking apart pieces, but they actually started reading it through. And they've grown remarkable rate, really knowing what their Bible says in these past two plus years. 
And that's what happened to me after 9-11. After 9-11, it was like a wake-up call. And I started reading my Bible and wanting to understand these things. And my husband, after March of 2022, it, you know, he's like, whoa, we're, we're actually in the last stretch. And he started listening to his Bible over and over and over again. And it completely changed him. And so we've heard this from so many where this wake up call of we're actually going to get to see Jesus face to face is, is, is a wonderful motivation. So the spiritual growth isn't propelled by fear. It's not, oh no, if I don't get my act together, then, you know, the boss is going to come in and I'm going to get fired. It's not that it's, this is real. And it's out of that awe that the Bible is actually coming to life right in front of us, that this is, that this is this proof that this is this, this is what reality is. The world can be, the world can be so engrossing that you forget what reality is. It can be just like a, it can be so distracting. But when you start to see the world through a biblical worldview and you stay in your Bible, it changes everything. It changes the way you see the world. And so it's all that God's word is actually happening. It's actually happening around us that it is real. You know, I, I think it's I think it's a beautiful play on words that God did that the nation of Israel is real. <laughs> when you say the name of Israel, you're reminding yourself that God is real, that his promise is real, that his book is real. And, and no other religion, you know, has a book that can tell you the future with 100% accuracy. And more and more are realizing that and waking up and coming to Jesus because they see that they can trust it. They're trying to find what they can trust. There's so many different messages. And there's only one truth. So, you know, why are believers afraid? Many may just be that they don't know him. And that's what's so scary. Uh, the, the most frightening words is, I never knew you. And, you know, this is Jesus's words here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name. And then I'll declare to them, I never knew you depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. And notice right here, these were people that were doing churchy stuff. These were people that were prophesying, doing miracles, casting out demons. These, these were people that thought they were doing the work of God, but they didn't have a relationship with him. And so we need to know him personally. It's all about relationship. The enemy can counterfeit signs and wonders. And we see that increasing. And we see that during the, the uh, tribulation period, the enemy will counterfeit signs and wonders. The false prophet will be able to do great signs and wonders in the presence of the Antichrist. And so, and we see that today, we see that there, um, and there always has been in the Bible, there's uh, evidence of the false prophets and the magicians that, that, could, that could counterfeit signs and wonders. And so we have to be careful about that because there are spirits that can, that can copycat. So it's heartbreaking, but many who profess to be Christian do not know Jesus personally. And they may be trapped in a works-based religion or a cult. Uh, regardless, Jesus is the only way to salvation because he is salvation. Jesus is the door. Salvation is a person. It's not how good you are. It's not what you do. It's not what church you belong to. Jesus is salvation. He is the only way to the father. So what about our unsaved loved ones? And, you know, I, I get this, this is difficult. 
because I know many, they're like, I don't want Jesus to come back because I have loved ones that aren't saved. And what comes down to is we have to trust God. We have to, we have to understand who God is and trust him that he loves them even more than we do. Don't be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Philippians 4, 6. On Luke 15, 4, what man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that's lost until he finds it. And so Jesus is going after those ones that are lost. And it may just be, we hope that they come in before the rapture, but it may just be the rapture that shows them that, hold on a minute, this is real. This is actually reality. They weren't just some crazy Christians that thought Jesus was going to come get them. This is real. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? Romans 3 through. God is able and he loves your loved ones more than you know how to. Prepare yourself and trust God with those you love. Plant seeds now and leave behind resources for sowing those seeds. Um, Plant the seeds now and also prepare for them. So if you are raptured before they come in, you've left them something that shows the faith that you have. And it'll be something that can help them along the way to make sure that they, that they do find Jesus and they don't believe the lie. So, and I think this is, this is beautiful. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. For fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. And so when we're, when we're fearful, we're not trusting God. We don't really trust him with our loved ones when we're afraid. And that's, and I get it. I really do get it, but we have to trust him that he's good and that he's able. So the who behind the rapture, because that's what it all comes down to. We are so excited to see him and we see all the the signs around us, it's obvious. And we can get so wrapped up in wanting to get away before everything falls apart because you see all these scary things start to happen. But the reason behind the rapture, the excitement behind the rapture is Jesus, that we're going to get to see him. It's not about escaping, you know. I'm sure you guys have heard, and I hear it quite often. Um, you know, there's no problem I have that the rapture won't fix. <laughs> and that's true. You know, there's no problem that the rapture wouldn't immediately fix, right? But we don't want the rapture so our problems go away. We want the rapture because we want to be face to face with Jesus. Salvation is all about him. Uh, Jesus is the door to salvation and he's the only way. He's the only way. We were saved by him, to him, and for him. Salvation is the betrothal of our experience. If we're saved, then we are betrothed to Jesus. For I feel a divine jealousy for you since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. 2 Corinthians 11 2. And so we're in this betrothal period. We're in this in between period. We're not married yet. Um, we're in the betrothal period, the engagement period. The betrothal period is a preparation time. It's just the beginning for the bride. Everything is just the beginning. She hasn't even actually started her new life yet. She's waiting for her wedding. And a betrothal that never results in a wedding is a tragedy. I mean, a bride that's just waiting in her wedding dress and the groom never comes. That's a tragedy. But many Christians act like there's no reason to even put on the wedding dress. Everything's just going to keep on going on like it always has. And it's okay to just be betrothed forever. But a wedding is coming. We're not in a tragedy. 
we're in an epic story and our beloved bridegroom is coming for us. We will have a wedding and it's all about him because we are excited about the one that we're going to marry. The joy for the rapture isn't a result, isn't a result of lack on earth. We're not joyful about the rapture because we have nothing else to look forward to. <laughs> the joy for the rapture is a result of love for our savior. We are joyful because we want to see him, regardless of what's going on in our life, regardless of if our life is awesome or if it's really hard. Our joy isn't based on our circumstance. Our joy is based on him. And so who is Jesus? How, what can we know about him now on this side of being with him? And the Bible tells us a lot. So he wants us. He really wants us. And I say us instead of you, because sometimes we can have such a self-centered view of God's plan that we can somehow still insert ourselves as the main character, but Jesus is, he's the main character. And we are so blessed to be taken along with him. But he wants us. This is not just a singled out thing. We are part of something bigger. We're brothers and sisters that are united together. And he wants us. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hebrews 12.2. And so for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. That joy is us. Knowing that he was paying for and earning and redeeming his bride on the cross. That was the joy set before him. And he is our eternal life. And this is the testimony God has given us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. There's no other life but inside Jesus. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. There are not many roads that lead to God. Jesus is the only road. It's narrow is the way. Jesus is the only door. He's the only road. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above and not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. So Colossians right here is saying, be so heavenly minded that you are some earthly good. Because we want to be like him. And when are we going to, when are we going to be like him? At the rapture. When he appears, we will appear with him in glory. And Jesus is God. For in him, the full, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. And so Jesus is God. He created everything and he is head over everything. And we belong to him. We are his body. I can't even get my head around that. He is the creator. Jesus created everything. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creepy thing that creep upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so right away from the beginning, we have this picture of Jesus in the church. We have this picture of this purpose of marriage right from the beginning as a picture of our relationship with him and that we're created in his image. We're like God. 
We have a triune self like God. We have a body, we have a soul, we are a spirit. And so it's, we were made in his image, not that we look like him, but that we are like him through Jesus. So Jesus is our head. He's the head of the church. He's the head of the body. So instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become every respect, the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, Ephesians 4.15. And so we are his body, just as the husband is the head of the family, the wife coming alongside with him. That's that mystery in that picture of who we are with Jesus. He is our love letter. He, Jesus is the word became flesh. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. John 1 14. So here we see that Jesus is the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so when we read God's word, when we read the word, we are having this conversation with Jesus. He's speaking directly to us. He is that love letter. That's why it's so important for us to read it and know it for ourselves. He is our protector and our provider. I am the gate. Whoever enters in through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pastor. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah 32, 27. And so he is our protector. He's the door right here. This is what he was talking about. The, the shepherd there protecting the sheep that nothing could go in. It would have to get past him. And he's God. He can do anything. There's nothing too hard for him. So we can trust him to protect us and provide for us. And he is love. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. So he is love and he is everything. He is our everything. For in him, in Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. He created the angels. He created everything, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He holds everything together in its, in its substance even. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in all things, he may have preeminence. And so this is just huge right here to try to dissect and understand. But how amazing is he? He is everything. He holds everything together. And we're his bride. We're his body. We get to spend all of eternity discovering what that is, what that means. So our final thought is, Jesus is the who behind the rapture. He is what we're excited about. Uh, it's so fun to think about what we're going to be like, what, you know, what our bodies are going to be like, our glorified body, you know, not having to worry about being sick, getting to eat whatever we want to, you know, um, what will heaven be like? What is our dwelling place that he's provided, that he's made specially for us? What's that going to be like? Seeing those loved ones that have passed away getting to meet the heroes of the Bible, you know, getting to meet Paul and, and Daniel and David. And, you know, I'm, we could just, uh, Abraham and Moses, it, it's going to be amazing to get to, to get to talk to them. And they're going to come to us and they're going to say, what was it like living in the moments before the rapture? What was it like not having to die? You know, what was it like to be going about your business and then bam, being raptured? What was it like seeing the tribulation unfold before your eyes? And so it's interesting. We'll, 
we'll have something to bring to the table and to talk about with our heroes. Uh, seeing angels and the heavenly creatures. But the real joy is who we are raptured to. And we need to keep that in focus. The real joy is Jesus. He's the center of everything. Jesus is going to rescue us. And he has already rescued us. And he's got us safely in his hand. It's already done. We're waiting to experience it. But it's already done. He has us in his hand. He's holding on to us. So 1 John 3, 2 through 3 tells us, Beloved, now we are the sons of God, and it's not yet appeared what we shall be. But we know that when he, when Jesus shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, and every man that has this hope in him purifies himself, even as he is pure. So we have this, this hope of Jesus. He's the who of the rapture.